Okay, I think uh, my voice is audible now to those who are online. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Lord, we commit our class into your hands, O oh Lord. We pray that even as we reflect on some of the passages in Chronicles, uh, you would speak to us, you would minister to us, and we pray that we would be corrected, encouraged, built up in your word, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, yeah, we've covered the book of Samuel, and then we moved into the book of Kings. So today we will look very briefly at the book of Chronicles. Just like the other two, uh, the book of Chronicles also was written as one single volume. And then when they were doing the translation into the Greek language, they were unable to fit the entire book of Chronicles onto one single scroll. And so they had decided to split it into two parts. And that's basically how we ended up with First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. Um, yeah. Uh, so coming to the author of this book, there is one suggestion by people that Ezra might have written you know, the final compilation where he puts together all the records and then uh, uh, arranges the material in a particular order under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They say that it was probably Ezra who did this because the last verse of Second Chronicles and the first verse of Ezra are almost similar. So they say that maybe Ezra is the one who did the final compilation of second of the book of Chronicles, and then he also wrote the book of Ezra. Let's actually look at these two verses and see the similarity between them. Uh, so if we could have, um, oh, we can't have anyone reading out the verse. Okay, um, yeah, those who want to read, um, you know, in their um, online uh, Bibles, they can do that. But then we will have someone read out over here for the class. Uh, so yes, if someone in the class over here could read out so that everyone you know, who is here can follow. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 23. So if any one person with a loud voice can read out that for us here in the class. Second Chronicles 36, 23. And those of you who are online, if you can just follow in your Bibles. Uh, Second Chronicles 36, 23 here in the class. Here we have Cyrus speaking in this very last work, verse of the book of Chronicles. And he says, I've been appointed by the uh, God of the earth to build a temple for him at Jerusalem. This is what he writes in his official records. Um, now, if you were to look at Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, if someone could read out that. Ezra 1, verse 1. So here in Ezra 1, 1, we see that Cyrus makes a proclamation throughout his realm. And he also puts it in writing that he is going to allow the people to go back to their homeland and they will be allowed to build a temple uh, to Yahweh, you know, back in their hometown. Um, so we see that there's a similarity between the last verse of Chronicles and the first verse of Ezra, which uh, causes some people to suggest that maybe Ezra is the one who wrote, who compiled Chronicles and also wrote the book of Ezra. So the thing to note down here is that when the book of Kings was written, if you remember, the book of Kings was uh, probably most of it was put together during the time of Josiah, but the final compilation was done after the people went into exile. So in Babylon, the scribes must have done the final uh, compilation of Kings because it talks about the about how Jehoiakim, who was in Babylon as a prisoner, was shown mercy by the uh, Persian king at that time. Uh, 
uh, by the by the Babylonian king at that time. So we see that uh, you know they could not have known that beforehand. So most probably the final compilation of kings was done after the people had gone into exile. On the other hand, this book Chronicles is being recorded after the people have come back from the exile. So either Ezra or somebody who has come back has now compiled and put it in its final form. So the message, the purpose being of each of these two books will differ. Why would kings have been written? It was written at that time during their time in exile because the people would have had many questions on their minds. They would have said, um, the temple is in Jerusalem. How could God allow Jerusalem to be destroyed? How could God allow the temple itself to be destroyed? Has God rejected us? Why has all this happened to us? God made a covenant with David and promised that he would always look after his dynasty. So why has this happened? They would have had so many questions. So Kings was written to answer those questions. But now Chronicles is written for a different purpose. Now the people have come back. And now the people are asking, you know, we, had, we are back in our own land, but now we are under Persian rule. So what has happened to all the promises of God? Will the kingdom be restored again in Israel? Will David's descendant ever sit on the throne again? What's going to happen to us? Is the Lord angry with us still? So now they have a different set of questions. So Chronicles would have addressed the new set of questions which the people are you know, um, now uh, having in their minds. So in Chronicles, the writer focuses on talking about the religious history of, um, of the kings. Second Samuel and the book of Kings, the focus is more on the political history of the kings. But when you come to, sec uh, to Chronicles, here the focus is more on the religious, uh, you know, uh, history of the people where the chronicler, the writer is focusing more on the spiritual condition of each king and how he treated the temple, how he was in his relationship with Yahweh. And also another thing which we notice is the chronicler focuses only on the kingdom of Judah. There's no mention made at all about northern Israel. The entire book of Chronicles focuses on just the uh, southern kingdom of Judah because the writer is trying to assure the people that yes, because of their sinfulness, they were taken away into captivity, but God has not forgotten his promises which he made to David. He will fulfill them. There will be a future for this nation. And God is still remembering the covenant promises which he has made to his people. So even though they have come back and now they are no longer a free nation, now they are under foreign rule. Yes, there is still hope. Okay, so um, while kings told the people, reminded the people of how sinful they had been, they and their kings, as a result of which God has taken them into captivity. Now they are being given hope once again. So Kings conveys a message of doom and destruction, the judgment which is to come upon the people. On the other hand, Chronicles is re, uh, you know, recultivating hope in their hearts that even though judgment came upon them, God still cares. God still remembers his covenant and God will give them a future and a hope. Uh, so that's the difference which we see between Kings and Chronicles. Um, so that is why, because now the focus is entirely on the kingdom of Judah and how out of this Judah dynasty, a Messiah will one day come who will sit on the throne of Israel once again, because the entire focus is on this dynasty of Judah, on the Davidic dynasty. Um, when you look at the genealogy, which is there in the first few chapters, because if you see in your Chronicles, the first nine chapters are devoted to just the genealogy. Chapter one has got a general genealogy all the way from Adam. And then you have all the different nations coming through him. Uh, that's more a general genealogy. But chapter two onwards, the focus is entirely on Judah. So if you look at uh, first Chronicles chapter two, 
that entire chapter only talks about the genealogy of one tribe generally you know when you have a genealogy the genealogy starts with the oldest son but over here you don't have uh, the genealogy of the tribe of reuben being described here it's the genealogy of judah which is being described in chapter 2 then what happens when you go to chapter 3 chapter 3 the entire chapter is focusing specifically on david's lineage so you know juda is made up of many many families uh, lots of uh, you know children they gave birth to grandchildren and the grandchildren gave birth to many more children so you have a lot of households in juda but this chapter 3 is entirely focused on one family david's family and his lineage so entire chapter 3 is devoted to that what up what about chapter 4 when you go to chapter 4 they are still talking about juda only thing now of course they're talking about the other clans you know the other households in the tribe of juda finally when you come to chapters 5 to 8 there it starts talking very briefly about the other tribes and the people uh, you know the, the the lineage of those families so chronicles is focusing completely on the davidic lineage because the hope that is there for the people is going to come out of this davidic lineage where a messiah will one day be born and he will again restore israel back to the glory which it was supposed to have in the beginning so that is why sometimes you know chronicles is described as the history of two houses uh and when i had mentioned earlier when it talks about house it's not talking about a building it's talking about dynasty so chronicles is basically the story the history of two houses uh let's look at a verse which uh brings out this uh, we'll look at a couple of verses which talk about this uh so those who are online if you can read in your bibles and here we will have someone read out aloud for us first chronicles chapter 17 verse 1 Now he came to pass, and David said in his house that David said to uh, Nathan, "The prophet Lo, I dwell in the house of Caleb, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remains under the curtain." Yeah, so he says, "I am living in a grand palace. My palace is made up of cedar wood. That is one of the most expensive woods available back then in those times." so he says i am living in a palace that is made of cedar on the other hand if you look at the you know the house of god that is just in a tent in a tabernacle so his desire is to build a house for the lord he has a noble desire in his heart and that is what we see in verses 10 to 12 so yeah if someone could read out for us first chronicles 17 10 to 12 Ah, then twelve. So David expresses a desire to build a house for God and God says I don't need a house I'm going to build you a house instead so in that way it's a history of two houses David desire is to build God a house and God says forget that I'm going to build you a house and your house your dynasty will be responsible to maintain my house and show honor and respect to this temple which is going to be built okay so uh, if you look in the hebrew there's a lot of word play you know where this word house is used in a significant manner where david is talking about how he wants to build god a house and god says you know what i'm going to build you a house you're the one who actually needs it and it's going to be the responsibility of his house of his dynasty to always honor the house of god which is going to be uh, built and so the lord says to him one of your sons he is the one who will be given this privilege to build me a house so david was very clear in his understanding 
that he would always just be the human representative of Yahweh. Yahweh would be the king of kings. Yahweh's house would be the actual royal palace. So it's not the king's palace which will be the royal main palace from where decisions would be taken. It would be the it would be the Lord's house, his house which would be the royal palace and he the king would make the decisions for uh, Israel. This is something which David understood but then you know by the time uh, Solomon came along he had forgotten that vision. Uh, let's look at a couple of verses which bring out that. Um, First Chronicles 28 verse 5. First Chronicles 28 5. How look at how this kingdom is being described over here. He says, My son Solomon has been chosen to sit on which throne? Not on just David's throne. The description of the throne is this Solomon will be sitting on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord, not the kingdom of David. Solomon will be sitting on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord. So it's, it's always going to be the Lord's kingdom, not uh, David's kingdom or Solomon's kingdom. And we see that uh, truth being brought out in another verse, 1 Chronicles 14, verse 2. 1 Chronicles 14, verse 2. Yeah, if... Um, so... What happens is you have the king of Tyre, someone named Hiram. He sends messengers to you know David saying, I'm going to send you cedar logs for you to build a palace for yourself. I mean, imagine a king from another nation is offering to send him the ex most expensive wood, probably at a heavy discount. So the king is offering to give him cedar to build his palace and David recognizes the fact that he's being exalted. He's being placed high in the eyes of all the other nations. All the other nations are looking up to him. They admire him and they are sending him gifts. And this is what David recognizes. He understands that his kingdom had been highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. David did not think, oh, I am being exalted so that I can be great. He so clearly understood this very simple, important, basic fact. He's not being exalted so that he'll become big. He is being exalted for the sake of the people, so that the interests of the people will always be protected. And then Solomon forgets that later. You know, he starts building an empire for himself, uh, which is not what God intended. So these human kings failed. But when the messianic king, when he comes, he will really care for the people. He will not just build, build an empire for himself, even though he's lord of lords and king of kings. He, his en entire empire will be about the people, about ministering to them, about caring for them. And then, of course, in the New Testament, we see that this king was willing to the, go to the extent of even sacrificing himself on behalf of his subjects. So while the human kings failed to live up to what God had in his mind for a king, the messianic king will be able to fulfill all of those requirements. So to be a king of Israel, your qualifications need to be very high. And one of the most important qualifications is to have a completely selfless heart. None of the kings had that. I mean, not even David was completely selfless. Only Jesus, you know, the king, so utterly selfless, where it says in Philippians that he was willing to become a slave and not just become a slave, he was willing to go to the point of dying on a cross, the most humiliating kind of punishment, you know, uh, that was there in those days. He was willing to go to that extent because he is that kind of a king. So why are we you know, um, dwelling so much upon this point? Because we need to understand that you and I are, yes, citizens of a particular country, 
and yes we are under certain political leaders some of them are good some of them are corrupt some of them are outright evil but we are actually uh, citizens of another kingdom and our king is amazingly good he was willing to sacrifice himself for us we are citizens of that kingdom so when the evil one comes against you and your family please remember yes Satan will use circumstances and the political environment of your country and the different situations, uh, you know, to oppress you, cause you to struggle, cause you to suffer. The rich will get richer. The corrupt will become uh, highly wealthy. The those who are honest and sincere, you know, will not do that well financially and in so many other ways. But remember this: you are under the kingship of Jesus. the best messianic king i mean better than any of the other kings while all the other kings failed this is one king who will never fail you and you are a citizen of his kingdom so never be restricted by the limitations which the world puts upon you so you so what you would do is each time circumstances come into your life which are going against what is good for your family you go on your knees you cry out to this king and you declare to him and tell him lord this is the kind of covenant into which you entered with me and my family so lord we will hold on to you we will not stop asking this this beautiful verse in isaiah can't remember the exact reference you know where it says so beautifully do not give yourselves rest and do not give god also any rest until he has established jerusalem so in fact you can claim that for yourselves you know you can say lord i know what kind of a king you are and you in fact you promised and said that we can no not give you any rest till you fulfill your word so you can ask the lord to establish you because you are under that kind of a king okay so those are the spiritual implications which come out for us new testament believers i mean for the people of that time the hope was that jerusalem will be restored you know to its political uh, uh, exalted state but for us the we have other another set of implications because we too are citizens of his kingdom um so look at the kind of loyalty which some people continue to show towards this yahweh and his temple most of the people you know we we've, we've looked already looked at second samuel we already looked at kings so we know how badly the people fell but there was this minority which held on to the lord and look at the way they lived that would be second chronicles 11 verses 14 to 17 second chronicles 11 14 to 17 if someone could read out there my love the proper and the politician and from the guild and politician miravam and wisdom that can them out from executing the priest of his unto the lord and he or they in praise from the high places and from the wealth and from the class which he had made And after them out of all the tribes of Israel, the children they had to see the Lord, God of Israel, the Creator, to sacrifice unto the Lord, uh, God of their fathers. So they strengthened the king, uh, the kingdom of Judah, and made Jehovah the son of uh, Solomon strong of three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. It talks over here about the Levites and the priests. and also all the other godly people in the different tribes um once jeroboam comes to power you know he does not want the true priests to be uh, having control over the nation simply because uh, you know the 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 true priests will will follow yahweh and not the golden calves which he has established so he uh, he basically fires all of them they are all out of a job the entire levite community and the priests are no longer in employment they have no means of supporting themselves so which means now they would need to look for other vocations you know other kinds of jobs to support themselves and they could have done that but what do they do it says over here they were willing to abandon their pasture lands and property and literally come to judah penniless because they had made up their minds we are levites we have been chosen to serve the living god so even if it means we have to go and live in juda without any land of our own no problem we'll go and serve the lord over there with that faithfulness they give up their pasture lands they give up their properties and many of them 
come to live in Judah. You know, once northern Israel, you know, uh, rejects them, they are willing to make that sacrifice so that they can come over here to Judah and continue serving this Yahweh and honoring his temple. Um, and not just the Levites and the priests, we also see that all the ordinary households, normal everyday people from the different tribes of Israel, all those who still have a love for the Lord in their heart, it says they followed the Levites to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices to the Lord. So they did not celebrate the festival set up by Jeroboam. They never bowed to those golden calves. They continued to make the trip to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices here once a year or maybe twice a year. So there, were, there was this one handful which recognized the privilege which they have under the living God and they did not leave him. So let us be people who recognize the privilege we have to be under Jesus the messianic king and let us you know honor him and show our loyalty to him even if it involves financial loss or you know any other kind of other disadvantages uh, so we see that beautiful thing about this set of people in the evil times of jeroboam and um, the lord kept his word to david we see that um, if we could if we could have someone read out actually from first kings uh, First Kings chapter 9, verse 5. What does it say over there about David? The Lord promised David and said, You shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. So as long as kingship lasted, in uh, the land of Israel, there was at least one Davidic king sitting over there until, of course, the foreigners came and they took over and then, you know, the, there was no more king. You only had governors after that. Uh, so up to the time that kingship was there, the Lord saw to it just as he had promised that David would, would never fail to have a successor. Um, this is what happens in the time of uh, Jehoram. Um, you know, this is uh, basically Jehoshaphat's son, you know, the godly king Jehoshaphat, who gave his son in marriage to a most evil uh, lady. And she must have, you know, completely led Jehoram into sinful ways. Because when Jehoram, after his dad dies, you know, after Jehoshaphat dies, when Jehoram comes to the throne, this is what he does. Second Chronicles 21 verses 4 to 7, if someone could read out. Second Chronicles 21. Four to seven. So we see over here that Jehoram, which is actually such a foolish thing. I mean, after all, he is the crown prince. He is the one who got the throne. There was no need for him to murder his own brothers. But he does that, you know, because he wants to make his position even more secure. And of course, he's married to Atalaya, who went on to do mass murder later. So, you know, uh, murder literally ran in Ahab's lineage. And uh, so Jehoram picked up that. So when Jehoram comes to the throne, for no reason at all, he murders all of his other brothers just to make sure that none of them will take his throne from him. And after you know, his conduct in that manner, and after all his idolatry, it says, nevertheless, because of the covenant the Lord had made with David, the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. He had promised to maintain a lamp for him and his descendants forever. So the Lord kept his word even to such a rotten person as Jehoram because 
uh, you know, God had made his promise to David and God kept his promise. Um, but of course, we see punishment coming upon Jehoram. I mean, the Lord does punish him. He, uh, so he develops a uh, bowel disease, a disease in his intestines. Not particularly sure what kind of a disease that was. But the thing is, after two years, his intestines literally come out. I mean, it's such a terrible disease. His intestines bloat up to an extent where they literally come out of his body. Um, and he dies in a most painful manner. In fact, it says that over here uh, in Second Chronicles 21, verse 19, it says, uh, it says he died in great pain. And then it goes on to say, you know, the people don't even bother to burn a funeral fire in his honor, uh, the way they had done for his predecessors. And then it says that he passed away to no one's regret. Nobody even cared that he had died. And it, in fact, says that when he was buried, he was buried, you know, in Jerusalem, in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. So the people, in fact, were that disgusted with him. The Lord maintained his covenant faithfulness towards a man like that because of the promise which he had made to David. And in fact, we see that even in the next generation, right? Athaliah wants to murder everyone. But the Lord you know, stirs up the heart of Jehosheba so that she is able to rescue at least one descendant of David. So the Lord makes sure that up as long as the kingship lasted, at least one descendant of David will always be there on the throne. And then after that, of course, you have the foreigners coming in. They are, you know, they rule from uh, Persia and Babylon, and then later on from Greece and Rome. So you have a series of other foreign rulers coming and controlling them. In the in Jerusalem, uh, in Israel, you basically have governors appointed, like Nehemiah, who is appointed as a governor. And then you have other governors who come in. Of course, later in Roman times, uh, they do want a king uh, to be, you know, locally governing the people. So at that time, Herod, who is not even an Israelite, he bribes the Romans, he tries to bribe even the Israelites, and he climbs onto the throne after doing a lot of heavy bribing and a lot of murdering. So that's a different story. But the point is, as long as Israelite kingship was prevailing, David always had a successor. And in future, there will be a messianic king literally sitting you know, on, on the earthly territory of Israel as king of kings, Jesus. He will be the uh, messianic king who will rule forever and ever. So um, because of that, because of this promise which was you know, kind of imprinted on their minds in the book of Chronicles, the people hold on to this hope right up to Jesus' day. So they, after having you know, been told about this in Chronicles and after being reminded again and again in all of the prophetic books, the people are know for a fact that one day there will be one more Davidic king on the throne. And that is why when Jesus comes along, they are so excited. They think finally, at last, the king has come and now we are going to be free from all foreign rule. We will once again have our own political independence. Which is why, if you were to look at John chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, look at the way they address Jesus because they are thinking that, you know, he, they, he's going to be their king. Look at the wording which they use for him in John chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. If someone could read out. Exactly. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And who is coming in the name of the Lord? The king of Israel. They really believe that he is going to take up political kingship. But that was not Jesus' purpose. Because Jesus wanted to first of all bring about spiritual cleansing, purification, create a people for himself who will genuinely be his followers. And then the political kingship would come. So the Lord had his own uh, timetable, but the people did not understand that. And so they were so disappointed when they realized that Jesus is not going to bring them political redemption. And that is why that same crowd 
which said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. That very same crowd, they shout later, Crucify him, crucify him. In fact, when Pilate says, You know, whom shall I release to you? Uh, which prisoner do, do you want me to release to you this particular year? They choose a political revolutionary named Barabbas because they think at least this political revolutionary will do something for us if he comes out of prison. This Jesus, on the other hand, is not interested, has no political interests in mind. So they are rather disappointed that what they had hoped for in all the prophetic books has not been fulfilled in Jesus. Um, uh, you know, getting back to our uh, story of the house of um, David, um, one thing that we see, God does not permit David to build a house for him, even though David had it in his heart. In fact, David is so eager to build a house for the Lord, even after the Lord says no, he says, okay, fine, I have not been given the privilege of building it, but at least I can make uh, plans for it. So he starts, you know, drawing the detailed blueprint for it. He collects all the gold and the silver which would be required for it. He makes preparations for the wood which would be required. He does everything. He puts his entire heart and soul into building that house, even though officially he's not going to be building it. His son will be building it. But he makes all the preparations for it. God does not give this man who has such a passion and love for him to build it. And God says, this is the reason why I don't want you to build it. And we see that in 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. If someone could read out that. in Yeah, and then he says, he is the one who will build a house in my name. So um, the Lord says, the reason I don't want you to build me a house is because you have shed blood, much blood, and have fought many wars. But isn't it God who blessed him and helped him to win in all of those wars? Isn't the Lord the one who helped him to have victory over the Philistines? You know, which the, which, which the other people had not been able to do. Saul had failed uh, and uh, even the judges before that had failed. So God blessed David and helped him to have much victory in all of his battles. But the Lord also says, because you shed blood, because you fought in the wars, I do not want you to build a house. In fact, he says that uh, in verse 9, he says, a man of peace and rest. You know, your son will be a man of peace and rest. Um, and he will have uh, rest from all his enemies on every side. I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. And that person will build me a house. It's because... God does not want his house to be associated with bloodshed, with violence. Because this house which is going to be built, it is going to be what? A house of prayer. We see that later, right? Um, this is what Isaiah 56 says about the house of God. Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7, if someone could read out. Isaiah, yeah. Hey, um, unless I wrote down the wrong reference, Isaiah 56, 6 to 7 is the. Ah. This house would be a house of prayer for all nations. So any foreigner who is willing to bind himself to Yahweh, 
he will be allowed access to come over here and place his prayer requests you know over here standing over there in that outer courtyard and it says that the lord would give joy to them in his house of prayer which is why jesus is so angry when they turn that outer courtyard into a marketplace because if you have a lot of people sitting over there and selling sheep and goats where are the foreigners going to stand and do their praying i mean in fact can you even pray with all the racket going on over there with all the noise of the sheep and the uh, you know merchants shouting and screaming the lord is highly angry because the lord wanted his house to be a house of prayer for all nations and so the lord did not want a man who has shed the blood of the nations to sit uh, to, to be the builder of this house uh, because this house is meant to be associated with joy with rest with acceptance so yes it is true that the lord had to use david to bring judgment upon uh, the, the you know the nations which were rebelling but god did not enjoy judging them that's a very important fact to remember even today the lord judges people when they have to be judged for their sinfulness but he does not enjoy it he takes no joy in punishing his heart is you know for the people to redeem to restore to save he takes no joy at all in punishing but when the people fail to follow his ways then he has to bring judgment because he it is fair it is fair and righteous to bring uh, judgment if he ignores injustice then he's just like the evil people who are doing the injustice so we see that the lord does not enjoy violence okay that's a very important point which comes across because god forbids david from building him a house um we don't have much time left um there are so many um kings whose lifestyles you know we could not uh, discuss uh, there are spiritual lessons which we could take away from their lives but there's no time we'll just look at one person manasse and we will look at all the evil that he did uh, we would have to refer to second kings for some of those passages uh, maybe we could read second kings 21 verse 3 Second Kings twenty one three. Hey, read no, read no, no, not much time. For he built up again the high places which Ezekiah his father had destroyed, and he erected uh, up of altars for Baal and made a tomb. As did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the folk of heaven, and served them. And also verse six. And he made his son pass through the fire, and observed time and used in hand, and dealt with Indian women and stars. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord, who drove him to anger. And also verse ten. And the Lord. Okay, so this man, he is the son of the godly king Hezekiah. You know, there are only two kings who are praised. Uh, who are really praised among the eight good kings in Judah, uh, Hezekiah and Josiah. So he is the king of Hezekiah, but because of Hezekiah's very very poor parenting skills, he turns out the way he does. So he basically this man, um, you know, Manasseh. It says here he rebuilt all the all the you know pagan places which his father had destroyed. It says he bowed down to all the starry hosts. so all the stars on the planets and the you know the demons connected with those planets he worshiped all of them in verse 6 we are told that he actually sacrifices one of his sons on the altar to one of the demons he's a man who uses divination he uses uh, witchcraft he calls upon mediums and spiritists uh, and it, and so in verse 10 it says that this man he did more evil than even the amorites who preceded him you know the people who had been living in uh, the land of canaan before the israelites came along and god said i'm going to send you israelites over there to bring judgment upon them 
you will destroy them and you will take the territories now the lord is making an observation and saying this man has done more sinful things than even those people what a horrible you know comment uh, to have to receive so that is the kind of man that he was and it says in verse 16 manase also shed so much innocent blood that he filled jerusalem from end to end uh, in its using poetic language of course but the point is he committed so many murders of innocent people who did not deserve to die so that is the kind of man that he was and therefore we see god's judgment coming upon him when the king of assyria comes in second chronicles 33 verse 10 onwards we are told that when the king of assyria comes uh, he puts a hook in his nose he binds him in bronze shackles and takes him away as a slave to babylon you know a cow uh, you basically put a hook in its nose and you drag it along in that manner like an animal manase you know a metal hook is put in his nose and is literally dragged so that is the kind of punishment which comes upon him and uh, you know I, i doubt anybody felt sorry for him because he had murdered so many innocent people but this man in his distress it says in second chronicles 33 verse 12 it says in his distress he sought the favor of the lord his god and humbled himself greatly and it actually says in in the next verse verse 13 that the lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea so when this man genuinely repents of his sinfulness the lord actually shows him mercy and the lord says all right you are forgiven i mean the lord forgave him for sacrificing his own child to an idol the lord forgave him for killing so many innocent people in the land the lord forgave him of all of those sins all those sins were put upon jesus on the cross even though it was manasseh who did those horrible things so that is the compassion and mercy of the lord and it's a genuine repentance which manasseh shows because once he comes back you know once the lord brings him back uh, home he gets rid of all the foreign gods he rem- that's uh, that that would be in verses 15 onwards second chronicles 33 he removes the image from the temple of the lord which he had put over there uh, you know inside the temple of the lord he had put this uh, uh, ashera or something and then he removes that uh, so he he takes out takes it all out throws them out and then it says he he began to sacrifice fellowship offerings and thank offerings and to ser- and he also told the people to serve the lord now onwards um and uh, so he does all of these things if you look at the story of ahab ahab also when god speaks punishment against him he he puts on sackcloth and is very very sorry but that is not a genuine repentance but because he does not change his ways shedding a few tears is not repentance feeling very very sorry for the punishment which has come upon your head is not repent repentance repentance is where you change your ways where you stop doing what you were doing earlier so ahab's repentance was fake but manasseh's repentance is true because when he comes back he demonstrates that he has truly repented and does the works of god okay so we see that contrast between ahab and manasseh so again we are out of time as usual so let's let's close with a word of prayer we thank you o lord for this chronicles book of chronicles which points us towards our messianic king jesus who is king forever and ever and lord even though we have not yet seen his physical kingdom in israel uh, we are enjoying the privileges of being under his covering so we pray o lord that we will always live uh, conscious of the fact that we are citizens of the king or, or uh, citizens of the kingdom of this kind of a king a king who was willing to sacrifice himself on our behalf and we pray o lord that like that small remnant in israel which continue to stay loyal to the lord we too in these evil times we too will stay loyal to you and honor you in all of our decisions even though it may cost us sometimes thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you